next on Craft in America. I don't live by the Grand Canyon. I have to find my beauty where I live. There's a lot to be angry about in this world. I deal with it by making art. For a lot of people, the closest connection they have to nature is a piece of wood in their home environment. My work is a direct reflection of the landscape in which I live. It's a raw, naked, truthful landscape. Tis a gift to be simple. Tis, Tis a gift to Sweeping pastoral vistas. The refuse of city streets. The limbs of a particular tree. The headlines of the morning paper. Artists look to the world around them for inspiration. How does landscape influence the act of creation? And how do artists translate this influence into a landscape shaped by their own hands? I think we're the only animal that seems to need to ornament ourselves. We seem to need to put things on us, and some of us need to make things that uh, get put on us. I was drawn to Philadelphia because it was a old industrial city with a lot of history. I like the landscape. I like the vistas. I think it's beautiful even in its decayed state. It offers daily visual complexity which I guess I feed on that. It's a buffet, it's a visual buffet for a visual thinker. This field has been a design laboratory in the middle of a very busy city. These plants will be in a tiara that I'm creating called a tiara of useful knowledge. The American Philosophical Society, which was one of the first institutions in Philadelphia, they wanted to promote useful knowledge. That concept of knowing what may be important in the future really resonated with me. This is the milkweed plant. The sap is a very sticky substance that's useful for adhesive. Bumblebees. I've started paying attention to grasses. Switchgrass could be used for automotive fuel. Look at these wonderful things. <laughs> Some people consider these weeds the worst weeds in the world, but I think they're beautiful. By drawing this leaf, I'm getting an understanding of the forms. The connections of the leaf to the stem is always a surprise to me. By looking closely at nature, I have the best teacher possible. I'm separating each of these leaves. I'll glue them onto a sheet of silver. I'm going to get some more glue on there. It dries pretty quickly. I studied art at Western Michigan University, and one professor suggested, why don't you start drawing with the saw? Why don't you bring your art into your metal? This stack of drawers is a glimpse of the journey that I've been on as an artist from the early 70s to last week. This was work that I did in the early 1980s. All of these have one rock in the necklace. People started sending me rocks from absolutely everywhere. 
This was my first clue at the power of nature. Now I'm going to go to the rolling mill. This is kind of like a printer's press. Now it's left a very subtle impression of the veining. I just have to get the glue and the actual leaf off. Then you have a nice piece of silver that is an echo of the leaf. For about seven years, I produced a fair amount of volume. And I was getting some coverage in the fashion magazines. Then at a certain point, I decided I needed to stop and refuel and begin thinking about a new body of work. That's when I started um, a huge amount of research on the history of jewelry, seeing how it was expressed in different countries in different time periods, whether it was just a simple floral wreath or a skin marking, it has always been with us. I need to look at my color photocopy because I'm not sure exactly where that stem comes in. Let's see. Yeah. Soldering. This is the cool part. You have two separate pieces of metal, and by adding a piece of metal with a lower temperature, you join them. I've done all this research. Then I decided I needed to do work that was authentic. It had to be of its place, of its time. So I thought, OK, now I'm going to narrow down, and it's got to be within a block of my studio. It's going to be somewhere within this block. It has to be here. If it's not here, it's not real. Is it tire treads? Is it sidewalks? Is it pigeons? What am I going to use? What am I going to use? I live in a neighborhood with a lot of problems. So I thought I had to look at that. And then I realized, here it is. It's always at my door. Every morning when I come in, I find a few laying there these little plastic containers for crack cocaine. About that time, I had found a really beautiful bone necklace. It's about a 1,000 years old. It was made by a Native American. The person had a dinner and carved it and made an ornament. So it was a common, readily available material. The one that was my common, readily available material were the crack files. These pieces are the plastic caps of the crack files cast into gold. As I started doing this work, people started responding to it. Some people are troubled by it. But I have to bring these issues up, and it's not going to please everyone. The survey of the sidewalk for City Flotsam could get a little depressing. It's tough stuff. And I asked, what's beautiful here? I don't live by the Grand Canyon. I have to find my beauty where I live. So that's when I started to look at the weeds across the way from the studio. So much of my work is the balance of man and nature, how much we rely upon the plants around us. I'm still in the process of working on the tiara of useful knowledge. I think that making things with your hands, it's a human core instinct. 
a really important part of us. And I think if we pay attention to the tactile power used in craft, we will come to realize those are probably the best and the purest values to have. One of the most wonderful things about clay is you make a three-dimensional object. It's an actual, tangible thing. I like that solidity and the fact that you can form these things from your mind. Occasionally, your hands almost feel like they're singing. They'll work in tune with the clay, and it takes on a life of its own without thought. And when that happens, it's almost magical. I'm still playing. You're not supposed to really be playing and enjoying yourself so much when you're 47 years old, but I do. I just enjoy manipulating the clay and making these little people and worlds. This is going to be the eyelids. The first time I worked with clay was one year it had rained a lot and a hillside had slipped away and so we saw some clay. My father and I dug it out and I brought a bucket of it home and the first thing I made was a, a Buddha. And I'd make surrealistic houses, little fantasy places. My mother's friends would come over and buy my pottery. And so that is what got me started. I've always been drawn to Mexican pottery and Mexican culture. And when I started doing clay, I started doing trees of life. In Mexico, they were made for weddings especially. And it was mostly trees of life with Adam and Eve symbols. And so they would decorate the church with these. They have their roots in the earth and they're reaching up to heaven. So it also shows man's quest for spirituality in our lives. I feel like all of the nature that's left is like the remnants of the tree of life and we have to appreciate all of it and be grateful for all of it. There's so many landscapes and so much variety just in 10 miles from here. I have almost an inexhaustible source of inspiration. The dunes here stretch for about 22 miles, all the way to the Grand Dune, which is the highest dune on the West Coast. What I especially like about the dunes is the solitude. I just feel free to wander without a direction. I'll find a nice hill and meditate there. This is the lupin bush that grows all over the sand dunes and has the flowers that are from purple to white. You can't compete with nature, you can just try to reflect it and be a part of it. I, I can't capture the bird songs in my pottery. 
and the sound of the wind, your feet on the sand. I personally don't think that any artwork is as beautiful as nature. I can't do that on a tile. It's just too infinite. I use underglazes, which are painted on the greenware. This is pieces that haven't been fired. It's just the dried clay. Then I fire those one time and then put a clear glaze over that. So it's fired twice. It comes out of the kiln looking like water on stone. I can remember as a child coming to Tijuana You'd see color everywhere. Whereas the culture I came from, people were reticent. So I use hundreds of colors. The rabbit has gotten here ahead of me. It's starting to eat the carrots. <laughs> I've been beaten to my crop. I can grow trees from seeds and cuttings in my yard, but with the trees of life, I can create my own tree. I've just sort of gone off from the Mexican version and added on my own images. This one's a California burning oak tree of life because oak trees need fire. So there's flames and this represents the water and then the Chumash symbol for the sun. This is an Adam and Eve tree of life. And here's the serpent right here. And this is the forbidden fruit. It's broken open so it's just waiting for you to take a taste. I think that if you follow your bliss, if you follow the things that truly inspire you, it will lead you to a, a good place. Craft is not always an individual pursuit. Built during the depths of the Great Depression, Timberline Lodge is the result of contributions from scores of artists. It is a prime example of how craft draws inspiration from the landscape and can become part of the landscape as well. Timberline Lodge stands today as a national landmark, but it was born out of a very basic need. People wanted a place to ski. I was uh, a skier, of course. I had learned to ski in Montana in 1923, and so I was a pretty, pretty early skier. We used to climb up the trails to Mount Hood ski back down, and sometimes we do that twice in a day. The Depression came along, and President Roosevelt started the Works Progress Administration. The WPA put people to work, building highways, building tunnels, whatever had to be done. B.J. Griffith was the administrator and he decided, well, wouldn't it be a great idea to build a ski lodge and build it by hand? Well, the workers were brought up on a rotation basis for the WPA. To sign up for relief work, they lost some of their uh, pride doing it, but that's what they had to do. 
they worked all during that winter in the snowstorms and the bad weather. The point was to put people to work during the Great Depression, not only carpenters and stonemasons and engineers, but also craftspeople, artists as well. They were just as much out of work as everybody else. Marjorie Hoffman Smith was hired to become the decorator, and she came up with the idea of flora and fauna, pioneer Indian Native American designs, and sort of bringing the outdoors inside. They felt they needed a woman's advice on certain interior details, which I think they did. At one time, I had as many as 200 people on my art project. Everything we did was made for use. We didn't blueprint it. We didn't have time to. We had people on relief, and we had to keep them busy. We had a few very fine artists. God, I can't believe uh, they're still here. It brings back memories, some very precious memories. Marjorie Hoffman Smith commissioned me to do these panels. They are incised linoleum colored with various layers of varnishes. The subject is outdoor camping in a rather lighthearted way. I like to do these little touches of animals and creatures who were uh, involved in this, this little guy. be anything like it again, but I can't really believe that I'm still here to see them. Timberline Lodge is a National Historic Landmark. Not only the structure of the lodge, but also all the furniture and the textiles all contribute to the historic qualities of the lodge. We consider the arts and crafts just as important as the stone and the wood and the rock. The restoration began in 1975 with the idea of replicating the original textiles. Marjorie Hoffman Smith kept all of her watercolor records. And from those records and black and white photographs, we figured we could recreate them. We have a little bit of freedom, and craftsmen like that little bit of freedom, but they're close replicas. Okay, one done. The WPA was sort of a moment in history. The proudest part that I see in all these years of me doing restoration is that we're the link between those generations. These rooms have been restored in the spirit of the original. Rawhide lampshade covers, little applique textiles. This ongoing restoration has caused the revival of a lot of crafts, uh, including and maybe most especially in blacksmithing. Making a ram's head fire poker. There aren't many pieces of ironwork in the lodge that we haven't duplicated at least once. The hanging lamps, handrails up and down the staircase, a lot of the door hardware. President Roosevelt came to dedicate the lodge on September 28th. 1937. It was a beautiful, beautiful day, and he uh, looked out, you know, with a great big smile to everyone. He said, Here I am on the slopes of Mount Hood, 
where I've always wanted to come. I am here to dedicate Timberline Lodge, and I do so as a monument to the skill and faithful performance of workers on the rolls of the Works Progress Administration. Times have gone past us pretty much now, but this will remain as a, as a memento of that wonderful period when it was still green, there were still trout in the streams. And it will be certainly a, a sacred place for the 20th century. It's like a cathedral of cactus out there. Saguaros that are the sentinels of the Sonora. It's a raw, naked place that speaks to the truth. It's a truthful landscape. My work is equally as honest because it's a direct reflection of the landscape in which I live. I try to draw a truthful line from the desert right into my heart and right out my graver. My parents owned the Dude Ranch from 1946 to 1960. And people from the east would come out and rope and ride and swim and be part of the desert. So it was quite a great place to grow up. It was a perfect childhood. I remember having a little toy with some scrolly kind of engraving on it and just being fascinated by that, by the intricacy of it. So I'm still fascinated by that. The child just got older. The key to all the work is the drawing underneath it. It's the real estate under all the jewelry. 40-foot saguaros, 30,000-foot clouds, all on, on this three-inch piece of paper. Then I'll transfer it to the metal. Then I will um, engrave those lines that I've uh, traced through. I've included Western motifs in my work because I live in that landscape, in that lifestyle. But I'm by no means just a Western artist. During my high school years, I was introduced to the psychedelic posters of the 60s with all the melting lettering that morphed into people and guitars. I could see that line work coming into my drawings. I started engraving at the University of Oregon at Eugene. It was a very disciplined, very hard thing for me to do, a young man to buckle down and study that. But I was intrigued by it. So I'll gently heat the piece, lock this in tight so it won't move when I'm engraving it. Engraver's ball over here, which is basically a sophisticated rotating vise, but the tools on this bench haven't changed in four or 500 years, except for the pneumatic graver. When you're finally down to the point of the graver, then you're at the razor-sharp decision-making. The resistance pushing the graver allows you to control your line better. I get a lot of inspiration from the Art Nouveau. And this was a style that was prominent at the turn of the century, but it evolved out of the classical scroll. This would be the classical scroll. That scroll is always even. Art Nouveau took that and just made it a little more fun. They'd start with that curve, 
but as you come in, you kind of kick it back and then vary the line weight, thin, thick, thin. So it makes a dynamics in that curve. And I like to leave about a third of a millimeter outside my engraved line because it forms a strong silhouette. You basically have three lines determining the shape. And I picked that up from the Art Nouveau posters of Alphonse Mucha's famous ladies with all their hair and the way he outlined them. That triple line really helps give the, give the shapes a lot of power. I think I gravitated toward the medium of jewelry because you get to control your own little world and you're creating this fine object that people can appreciate. I love working with skeleton themes. So I do this kind of loose version, my version of the Day of the Dead theme, Mexican tradition of honoring the memories of loved ones who've passed. And they poke fun at death. Let's live now. That's what it's all about. These bracelets have a special message on the inside affirmations of positivity to wear against your skin. Treasure lies within ye, which is the cool thing about the pirate and all of us. But it's good to feel free on whatever ocean you're cruising on. My sculpture is a completely different thing than working in the jewelry because I'm working with found objects. I've amassed about 35 tons of stuff in my yard. I call it the Library of Visual Solutions because that's exactly what it is. All the sculpture I do, I choose from this library of shape. Look at the implied primitive face. These are picks. Now it starts to look like a rib cage. This, I'll just give it a new life into sculpture, parts or whole pieces. This is my best piece so far. It's all made out of uh, Caterpillar tractor parts. I think I'll keep it. <laughs> the distinction between art and craft is so close because you have to know your medium well enough to express your heart to make art. <laughs> Well, we finally got the finished brooch, and I've set it with this nice piece of green Curico Lake turquoise, like spring in the desert. I've done the saguaro with the 18 karat green, the other saguaros in the cliff and the 18 karat paint gold. Uh, I've made that over the Sterling Thunderheads. The Sonoran Desert at dusk. This is truly a peaceful place and truly paradise. I can crank out that intense work because I've got the contrast of this beautiful, peaceful place that sustains my spirit. I've got a lot to do here. There's a spirit in trees that's very deep. And in order to produce a fine piece of furniture, the spirit of a tree lives on. And I can give it a second life. Because I can make an object that lives and can live forever, possibly. Dad really believed that there are spirits in the wood that enhance people's lives. And you know, not everybody can live in the woods, but they can live with wood and stay connected to nature and to the divine in that way. George Nakashima is one of the formative designers of the 20th century. 
It was influenced by traditional Japanese design, by American shaker design and country design. So there are influences, but he took these things and combined them in a way that nobody had ever done before. Maybe 10, huh? Yeah, maybe. Well, I guess my dad was my primary mentor, although when I grew up with him, I didn't think he was anything but dad or that he was doing anything unusual that dads didn't do. <laughs> I was born in Spokane, Washington. I've lived almost every place else, such as France and Japan, and then India. His first training at University of Washington was in forestry, and after two years, he switched to architecture. In 1940, my father made up his mind that he would do furniture because he could control the process from the beginning to the end. To this day, it's probably a little more control than we need to have because we actually go out and look at trees. These are all ours? Yeah, these are all your trees. I'm looking forward to cutting them, sort of. <laughs> We actually decide right on site how we're going to cut them. Now, it's amazing because you never know what's going to be inside there until you get there. Dad used to take me along to the lumber yard and he'd say, well, when you cut a tree, it's like cutting diamonds. And we'll cut it this way because the grain's more beautiful that way. Wow! Oh, wow, look at that. Beautiful. I was in Tokyo, and I met a young lady there. And we returned to this country, and we became married. And then uh, war broke out, Pearl Harbor. And one of the results was that we were put into concentration camps, about which most Americans didn't know anything. In the camp, Dad would teach this fellow woodworker how to design things, and the fellow would teach him how to make things. So they developed inventive ways of using the old army cots and scrap materials. I still have the toy box that he made for me when I was in camp. Coming down. Go for it. Art has to be beautiful. Craft implies, in my father's definition, that it should be something that's practical and useful in life. When Dad first had his show at the American Craft Museum, it was the first time it was exhibited as if it were works of art. Up until then, it had just been furniture. George is really identified with the concept of the naturalistic top laid on top of a very architectural base. It's both natural and man-made simultaneously. Yeah, I worked with George for uh, 17 years or so. One of the uh, approaches that George took was the looking for the soul of the tree. It means that the woodworker has to not impose his own thoughts on the tree. The tree is given a chance to come forth with its story, and in that dialogue, convey something to the woodworker. I was pretty much the understudy. He never told me the way to do things, he would just change a line. He wouldn't tell me why he changed the line. And I can't count the number of times I was fired <laughs> while Ted was alive. It was very good discipline. <laughs> In 1984, he came across an enormous walnut log, and he had this dream to make peace altars for each of the continents of the world. Yeah, that's good. Pretty flat. No twist. No twist. He thought if people had an altar where they could resolve their differences, that we would be that much closer to world peace. 
He made the first altar, which was installed at the Cathedral St. John the Divine in 1986. He was trying to negotiate sending a peace altar to Russia when he passed away in 1990. I hope we can find something else that matches, otherwise I think I got it. The reason we built this shed is that when Dad passed away, there was a huge stack of lumber sitting out in the rain, and we had nowhere to put it. Nice smaller board from that. So I thought momentarily of maybe selling it at that point. Pretty. And then we thought, well, you know, that's Dad's last legacy. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, it's got some nice color. Yeah. After the uh, log is cut, it has to air dry for at least a year to two years just to stabilize itself. Once they're dried, uh, select them for each particular job that we do. And it's, it's a long process. Mira Nakashima is really the only true heir to the Nakashima legacy. Mira is now functioning in exactly the same way that George did, making decisions about how to cut the board. Get rid of those corners a little bit. Where to put the legs, where to put the butterflies. She's the only person who is designing in the Nakashima style. Her work is somewhat different than her father's work. What that means, really, is the pieces that are coming out of the studio today are Mira Nakashima pieces. I just sort of picked up the pieces where Dad let them fall and have tried to continue his tradition and explore it a little further. In India, they believe that beauty is, is man's connection to the divine. Dad's whole operation here has been, he called it his karma yoga his way of being, which is a form of meditation. Some people get it, some people don't. But I hope that that tradition can continue somehow because it's very meaningful, it's very important in our world today. And if we end up with something that pleases us and, and pleases others, uh, we feel that the destiny of a piece of wood has been fulfilled. History is filled with follies. And we keep repeating the same damn mistakes over and over again. We don't even wait for a generation to pass sometimes before we launch into a new mistake. There's a lot to be angry about in this world. There are many ways to uh, deal with that anger. I deal with it by making art. There's a rich and terrific history of artists protesting war. I feel privileged to be a part of that. I'm often asked why I make teapots. Well, I use a teapot only metaphorically, really. I'm more interested in conveying ideas than I am tea. In 1980, I first came to Montana. I love the expanse of landscape. But I don't know that the landscape really affects the work. I'm, I'm working out of a political landscape, really. I'm getting good reduction. I've reduced the uh, oxygen level in the kiln. The flames just come jumping out because they're literally seeking oxygen. I'm just putting a little more gas in so it'll fire a little quicker. I do about a four-day firing cycle. 
drives my wife crazy. Uh, you know, I get up every two hours to check the kiln. I was born in Chicago shortly after World War II. I've always made things by hand. When I was a kid, I was constantly making models. My father was an immigration lawyer. We had many gifts from Chinese clients in our house. And so from a very early age, I became very fascinated with the intricate, with detail, uh, with very tight, meticulous carving. When I was a kid, I remember seeing the very stark footage of the discovery of the concentration camps, the piles of bodies. It had a very, very strong impact on my life. I'm carving ears. There are two different clays that I layer so that what I get in the end is, is something that looks very much like sedimentary rock. It's part of this ongoing project that I call the Legacy Project. And it consists of a pile of ears. The pile keeps changing. And there's so many different layers of meaning. You know, the fact that ears have long been used as a way of counting the dead in war. The other thing about the pile of ears is I was very much trying to recapture the sense of uh, uh, the pile of shoes after the Holocaust, the remains of people that are gone. So there are ears that are stone deaf. They're not learning the lessons that are all around us. You know, I work from a place that's, that's deep inside me. That, 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 that I'm very passionately angry about. I'm pissed off that there are nuclear weapons, you know? If an artist can't say what they really feel in their art, you know, what the hell is the point? Okay, right there. Got it. Okay. The vessel is really the primary canvas of ceramics. And uh, the teapot is the most complex of vessels. You can really play with a lot of images and juxtapose a lot of different images to build a narrative. Urban destruction from World War II becomes a teapot. This is the handle. Uh, the lid right here just kind of lifts out. And uh, this rubble creates a vessel which connects with this kind of tilted, broken chimney, which becomes a spout. The teapot was literally invented in Yixing, China, about 1500 AD. Suddenly, there was an explosion of creativity. All different forms, from segmented forms to natural forms to geometric forms. I'm inspired by these pots. I'm inspired by the craftsmanship, the finesse of line, the compositions. but. While I imitate the pots in a technical and sometimes aesthetic sense, I'm not making Yixing pots. I'm trying to make pots that have a separate cultural identity, that speak of my times, my country, my concerns. These are going to be for clay tiles in framed editions. Press molding is kind of like printmaking, really, in ceramic. I like the hand nature of this process. There are ways of mechanically doing this uh, where they come out perfect and they'd be much quicker to produce but uh, I'd lose a little bit of that handmade quality. You know, when I was in graduate school, 
There's sort of a disdain for craftsmanship. Kind of challenging the status quo at the time. People said my work was too small, tight, and precious. And uh, I took it as a compliment. There was a Chinese master who once said that to make art, you develop an infallible technique and then place yourself at the mercy of inspiration. And I like that. You know, a work of art can't rest on technique alone. There has to be a strong idea, a strong concept behind that. cracking on this. There's a high degree of loss with this technique. This is a pretty one. Our human species is very amazing. You know, we have these two potentials between creation and destruction. If all creative people stop making art, I really think we'd perish as a species. I'm not gonna make the ear that saves the world. I'm not gonna make the teapot that saves the world. But, you know, Gandhi said, you drop enough grains into the mightiest machine, grains of sand, and you'll stop that machine. So I figure, okay, th this is my contribution to man's collective creativity. Working with our hands has always been with us, and it will remain. I try to celebrate this beautiful earth, and it never ceases to inspire me. You perfect your craft, and then you start putting your voice into it, and your line, and your heart. The real struggle, I think, is a creative struggle. It's got to come from within. You're the only one who knows your passions. And it's transferring that feeling to other people so that they can understand the beauty of the divine. Major funding for Craft in America was provided by Cynthia Lovelace Sears and Frank Buxton, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Lillian and John Lovelace. L.L. Brownrigg. Wingate Charitable Foundation. Helen and Peter Bing. The National Endowment for the Arts. Stoloroff Foundation. Kathleen Collins. Additional support was provided by the following. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to Yeah.